Hello and welcome to this session of Maritime Medicine. This is Jonathan Busco and we'll be discussing sprains and strains. By the end of this session you'll be able to identify and manage a joint sprain, identify and manage a muscle or tendon strain, and manage a back strain with or without sciatica symptoms. So sprains are injuries to the joint structure so it's the ligaments that hold the joint together and it's a tear and they're typically partial tears so there's just a little bit of an injury it pulls apart but it's still holding together maintaining the structure of the joint but you can get complete tears and in that case the joint loses its stability they're associated with pain because you're tearing a structure you tend to swell not because of inflammation but because of bleeding, you're tearing apart a structure that's supported by the vascular system and you get local bleeding and swelling. And then you get some edema as well, fluid that leaks out from cells. These tend to be diffusely tender, so you feel all around the joint and it's tender more globally. Sometimes you can find the specific ligament that's injured and you press on it and that really hurts and that's very helpful and we'll talk about the ankle rule shortly, but these can be very difficult to distinguish from a fracture. And so if we could never distinguish them from a fracture, we'd have to treat them all like fractures until we got an x-ray. Fortunately, there are some clinical rules that we use in emergency medicine that tell us which of these patients do and don't need x-rays. And the only reason we get an x-ray is because we think there's a fracture. So using cl clinical rules, specifically for the ankle and for the knee, we're able to identify which patients we don't think have a fracture or at least don't have a fracture that matters that we need to know about. This is important for you because you can apply these rules and decide who needs to be evacuated or at least immobilized and have an x-ray done at your next port and who can just be treated for a sprain and not need any further follow-up necessarily. So the Ottawa ankle rules describe who gets an injury to the ankle or the foot and who needs an x-ray. So as you feel along the posterior six centimeters of the backs of the tibia and the fibula, so these are the distal tibia and fibula, these are the parts of the bone that make up the medial uh, and the lateral malleolus, those lumps that stick out at your ankle. You're feeling along the posterior six centimeters. If they're not tender there, then you're not worried. If they are tender, they need an x-ray. The second criteria is that they're unable to bear weight both immediately and on the delayed exam. We typically say on the emergency department exam, but obviously your patients aren't going to the emergency department, but 20 minutes, 30 minutes later, you need to see can they walk. So a lot of people who sprain their ankle don't want to put weight on it immediately. It hurts, they're afraid, it feels loose to them, it feels unstable, they say that's it not doing it but you give them half an hour and then they're able to walk on it so if they can't walk on it immediately but 30 minutes later they can then they don't need an x-ray if they can walk on it immediately they don't need an x-ray but if they can't walk on it immediately 30 minutes later you try to get them to walk they can't bear weight and it doesn't have to be a full solid footstep it just has to be they put weight onto the ankle and then initiate a step and take the weight back off. Um, and if they can't do that, then they need an x-ray. You need to treat it as, as if it's a fracture. Now, it doesn't mean they need to necessarily be evacuated. You'll discuss that with medical control. You can immobilize the foot, put them into essentially a walking boot, depending on which side they've injured, and get an x-ray at a later time. And then you look for foot bone tenderness. So the metatarsals are the long bones that basically connect the posterior structures of the foot that, that make up the ankle and the big weight bearing areas to your toes. And so the fifth one is the lateral most one. And so basically where it starts, sort of a little bump on the lateral side of your ankle, that's the base of the fifth metatarsal. If it's tender there, then you need an x-ray. And then over the midfoot so just proximal to that you've got bones through there the navicular bone take a look at the 
web pages on the anatomy and identify where the navicular bone is, it's easier for you to look than for me to describe. If they're tender there, then you treat them as if they have a foot fracture. They need to be immobilized, and again, talk to medical control about what immobilization means. It's not necessarily that they're in a cast on crutches with their foot in the air. It means that they need to have support for the foot, and they may still be able to ambulate depending on your findings. And then they will need an x-ray at some point, but not necessarily immediately. So we can also sprain our knee, and that's a very common injury. It can be very difficult to distinguish a knee fracture from a knee sprain because they both hurt quite a bit, and they both take a lot of force when you walk, and so it can be very painful and limiting. So the Pittsburgh knee rules predict who needs an x-ray, which again means who has or who do we think might have a fracture that's clinically significant. And so in the Pittsburgh knee rule, first and foremost, the patient has to have either blunt trauma or fall as the mechanism of injury. Now, if they didn't fall or they weren't struck in the knee by something, they don't need an x-ray. That doesn't actually mean they don't need to have their knee immobilized or supported because if you tear your anterior cruciate ligament or you completely blow out one of your collateral ligaments, you're going to need to have the knee immobilized. But you're not worried about a fracture. So if no, there's no blunt trauma or they didn't fall, it's not broken. If they did have blunt trauma or they did fall, then you use the age criteria. If the age is less than 12 or greater than 50, then we assume that they could have broken the bone regardless of any other findings, broken a bone in, around the knee. And so those people need to have their knees immobilized and will need x-rays as soon as possible. Does this mean evacuate them? Well, it depends on how long it's going to take to get them to the next port. Part of it is, is once their knee is immobilized, in some ways you're assuming that there's a, a break until proven otherwise, and so you need to talk to medical control about whether or not these people can bear weight, and if they can't, they're not doing you much good shipboard. So if the age is between 12 and 50, and they had blunt trauma or a fall, then you need to assess whether or not they can walk four weight-bearing steps on your delayed exam. Again, the rule's written about the emergency department, but we'll call it a delayed exam, so more than 20 to 30 minutes after the injury. So they're in the sick bay, their knee's hurting them, if they can't walk four weight-bearing steps, and it doesn't mean they have to jump up and down on the injured leg, but they have to put their weight on it and then swing their other leg forward. They can't be holding on to something and not supporting themselves at all, but simply hopping on that foot. They need to actually bear weight on the injured leg. If they can, then no x-ray. We don't think they've broken it. If they can't, then they may have broken it, and you'll need to immobilize the leg. You'll need to talk to medical control about whether or not they can bear weight while they're wearing whatever it is that you've immobilized their leg with, and they're going to need an x-ray. So what do we do with this clinically? patient comes in. They fell. They hit their knee. They're 36 years old, but they can walk four weight-bearing steps. They don't need an x-ray. They're not broken. You may put an ace wrap on to support them. Um, but if they're older than 50 or they can't walk those four steps, you immobilize the knee, you talk to medical control, you figure out how you're going to get them for an x-ray. And unfortunately, there aren't any specific rules for the upper extremities that are, are as validated and are as good as the Pittsburgh knee and the Ottawa ankle rules. So you need to use your best judgment. Um, your immobilization is less inhibiting than evacuating them. So if you immobilize them, they may still be able to work depending on what their their task is. If they're an officer, they can probably work with their arm in a thumb spica. If they're an AB, probably not. And so you're going to need to make that call, speak to the master, speak to medical control, and decide what they can and can't do and when they do and don't need x-rays. Now, the management of sprains, we've decided the patient has a sprain, has changed over the years. 
used to be we would put people on complete rest. This concept of rice, rest, ice, compression, elevation, and then non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen or naproxen sodium. Well, it turns out that with any sprain or strain, the sooner you start to use the injured joint, the injured muscle, the faster it heals as long as you don't overuse it. And that's a somewhat tricky concept. So while you don't want to wait until you have no pain at all because that delays your healing, you also don't want to cause yourself severe pain or have the patient cause themselves severe pain in using that joint. So someone sprains their ankle. They probably do want to rest it for the first day or so. And rest doesn't mean doing nothing at all, but it means immobilizing it well uh, with a either putting on a splint of some sort or an air cast or a good solid boot that supports the ankle well and maybe walking a few steps at a time if it really starts to hurt they stop but they don't have to completely rest the ankle and do nothing at all after 24 hours start exercising it ankle rolls um, other activities and you can talk to medical control about what's going to be best that start to rehab the ankle and the longer it's immobilized the longer that they're not doing anything with it the longer the healing ice can reduce pain it helps somewhat with the swelling although the swelling in and of itself doesn't hurt anything but you don't want to make special times to ice we used to say oh you have to ice 15 minutes every two hours or 30 minutes every four hours or 10 minutes an hour and there wasn't a lot of consistency in the recommendations and it turns out that if you're stopping doing other things to ice, then you're prolonging healing. So ice if you're otherwise not doing anything with the ankle, but you don't have to make special times to do it. Again, it may help with the pain. In fact, it usually does quite a bit. Compression, so putting on an ace wrap, putting on an air cast around the ankle, building a, a little splint for it, that may support it and so they may be able to use it earlier you don't want to keep it on for an extended period it delays healing but you particularly something like an air cast which is a plastic clam shell it actually looks more like a muscle shell that goes around the ankle on both sides it's got an air cushion in it it's not a bad idea for someone who sprained their ankle to use that initially to support the ankle and then anytime they're doing something where they're at risk of re-injuring that ankle put it back on and then take it off when they're done. Elevation will decrease swelling, but again, if it's elevated, you're not using it, so it can prolong healing. If you are otherwise sitting down or resting, elevate it, and preferably elevate it above the level of your heart to decrease the swelling. On the other hand, the swelling doesn't really hurt anything and provides a bit of a cushion around the joint. And finally, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which were considered something of a mainstay to get rid of the inflammation. The thing is, there have been a number of studies that have looked at inflammation biopsies have actually been done of the injured areas and the swelling is from bleeding and leakage of fluid out of the cells not from inflammation and so the non-steroidals don't actually do anything in terms of an anti-inflammatory but they are good for pain so use them for pain control well, let's talk about some specific disorders uh, the chromioclavicular separation, which can be very hard to distinguish from the fracture. So the distal end of your collarbone attaches to your shoulder girdle. It actually attaches to a forward arcing piece of the scapula, your shoulder blade. And it's very common that you can separate those two. And if you look at this patient, he was in a motor vehicle accident on his right shoulder. He's got a normal looking chromioclavicular joint. And if we zoom in on that left shoulder, we can see that there's a big lump that shouldn't be there. And if you examined him, you would find that it's right at the very end of the clavicle, and you can feel where it's separated from the acromion, the piece of the, the shoulder joint itself. As opposed to the x-ray down below, which is a mid-shaft clavicle fracture. And there the tenderness would be in the middle, and there wouldn't be so much discomfort at the end. And you can see at the very end that little gap... Um, 
So the as you're looking at the screen, the left is is medial, the right side is lateral. This is the patient's left shoulder, and just above the humerus, that bone that's coming in from the left the patient's left side or the right side of the screen, there's that little connection that's your cranioclavicular joint, and you follow that clavicle back towards the left side of the screen or the patient's right, and you'll see it's broken in the middle there. Now, the only way that gets tricky is if the distal clavicle is broken, but the good news is it really doesn't matter because the treatment for a clavicle fracture and an AC separation is the same. You put them into a sling, you give them pain control, typically a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, and it'll usually heal on its own. And you can have them get an x-ray when they get to port to figure out whether it's broken or just an AC separation and to have somebody make a, a longer term plan, which may involve physical therapy. Muscles and tendons don't sprain. Sprains occur to the ligaments that hold the joints together. Muscles and tendons strain or tear. So you pull those structures beyond their limits and they'll start to tear and they can be either complete tears or incomplete tears. And what will happen is that you'll end up with muscle spasm because of the injury to the muscle and possibly the joint will become unstable depending on what the tendon is that, that tore because the tendons, while their primary function is movement they connect the muscle to bone. Around that joint, they do provide some structural support. And if you completely tear a muscle, well, that doesn't really take away structural support, but it takes away your ability to move. So when you assess these patients, they'll have pain over their muscles or tendons, and you may be able to actually feel a defect. So if somebody tears their bicep, biceps muscle off of its origin, up by the shoulder, you may actually see the biceps, biceps muscle bunching in the middle of the humerus and be able to feel basically a divot in the upper arm uh, in the uh, origin of the biceps. And they'll have a loss of function. If they've completely torn the tendon or they've completely torn the muscle, then it just won't work. So if it's comp a complete tendon rupture, you'll get muscle movement without the bones that it's attached to moving. So if you look at this x-ray here, we're looking at uh, patients, obviously their Achilles tendon, they're laying on a stretcher, so you're looking straight down. On the right, patient's right, uh, which is also screen right in this case, you can see the Achilles tendon sticking out from the heel there, and the foot is plantar flexing. On the left, you can't see anything. There's a lot of swelling, edema, and the foot is not plantar flexing, and that's because they've ruptured their Achilles tendon on the left. So what do we do for these? We do, for partial tears, muscle rest, 24 to 48 hours. It doesn't mean complete immobilization, but it means using it very minimally. Heat or ice, whichever feels better for the patient. Um, one's not going to promote healing faster than the other. Compression may improve the symptoms, so wrapping a, an ACE wrap around the injury may help. And pain control, and the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories will help, and muscle relaxants will help with the muscle spasm. They don't do anything for healing, but they stop the muscle spasm, they make the patient more comfortable. If it's a complete tear, so thinking about that Achilles tendon, they can't flex their foot at all, then you need to immobilize them. So the two big ones that tend to tear are the Achilles tendon and the biceps tendon. So for the Achilles tendon rupture, you want to put the foot into plantar flexion. So that's the movement they can't do. So you basically need to plantar flex the foot manually. So push the toes down a little bit. Put your splint on. Make sure it's keeping the foot in plantar flexion and then wrap it and secure it that way and then they're non-weight bearing until they're seen at port. For a biceps tendon rupture, sling and swath and they're going to need to have surgery to have that reattached. Now back strains and back injuries are very common. So you'll see a lot of these and they can occur with very minimal provocation. 2003 
I'm 30 years old, 31 years old, I bend over to pick up a piece of paper, and my back goes into spasm. And I could not straighten up for almost a week. Very uncomfortable, lower back spasm, wasn't excessive activity. Uh, three weeks before, I had moved into a house, including moving a washer and dryer in pretty much by myself. No problem with that. So it doesn't take a big injury or blunt trauma or some huge event to cause this. The back's a very robust, but at the same time, somewhat finicky structure that you can get a fair amount of pain with. And you end up with a lot of muscle spasm. And depending on what the injury is, if it involves the discs between the vertebrae in the back, the nerves to the sciatic nerve, which is the largest nerve in your body that essentially gives you function to your leg, can be irritated and that can give you symptoms down the leg as well. This can be debilitating. We really don't think about how much we do with our back until we injure it. Then you discover that even something as simple as reaching out to pick up a cup of water takes stabilization of your arm going out with the muscles in your back and that causes pain. So very minor events can be fairly debilitating and take away people's ability to work. Now the other problem is is that back pain can be a sign of very bad, bad, bad disease. So you need to do a good history and a good assessment. If you've got someone with back pain that's been going on for two to three months and they've had a lot of weight loss, you're worried about cancer and metastatic disease to the back. For acute back pain, your big worry in hi your history is if they've had either urinary or stool incontinence. So not that they couldn't get to the bathroom, they needed to go, they knew they needed to go, but they were in so much pain they couldn't get to the bathroom and they peed on themselves. But they were sitting there and suddenly they were in a puddle of urine or there was stool in their pants and they didn't know that they had done that. Or conversely, that they couldn't urinate at all. That they feel like they have to pee, their bladder is really distended. When you push on their lower abdomen, you can feel it's distended. They can't pee at all and they have back pain. That's a bad sign of something called cauda equina syndrome where the lower nerves in the spinal cord are getting compressed. If they have a fever with back pain, uh, that's also a problem. And then you need to do a good lower extremity neurologic exam. So we've talked about the L4, L5, S1 motor and sensory testing before. You need to do that. You need to do proximal and distal muscle group strength. What does that mean? That means that they need to be able to flex at the hip and straighten at the hip flex and straighten over the knee, flex and straighten over the ankle, abduct their hips, which means they need to be able to push their legs out sideways, and adduct their hips. That means that they're able to pull their, their thighs together. And that gives you a pretty good muscle group testing. You need to test their patellar reflexes. You feel the patella, the kneecap. Just below it, you'll feel where the infrapatellar tendon comes off the bottom of the patella and attaches to the front of the tibia with their leg dangling down. Take your stethoscope and just gently hit that tendon. And If their leg is dangling loose and their, and their reflexes are intact, they'll kick out. You need to check for saddle anesthesia. And if you look at that picture of the dermatome there in the center, you can see that the lowest levels of your spinal cord actually innervate right around your bottom. S4 is right there over the coccyx. S1, 2, and 3 are over the buttocks and the medial thighs. Well, that's the area that would be in contact with a saddle if you were sitting on a saddle. So you need to make sure that sensation is intact there. It's, people think that touching the feet is testing the sensation of the lowest, lowest part of the spine, but it's not. It's actually right there around the buttock. And then they need to do what's called a straight leg raise. And they lay flat on their back. They keep their legs straight and they lift it as high as they can. And that tells you two things. If they get a lot of pain in their back, well, their back muscles are bothering them. If they get pain or numbness or electric shock shooting down their leg, that tells you that they've got irritation of the sciatic nerve as well. And it could be either leg when they raise it because actually traditionally in the, in the purest sense a straight leg raises, they get pain shooting down the leg they're not raising but I've seen it in both when they have sciatic irritation that it, they, 
the pain can either shoot down the leg they're raising or the leg they're not raising as they raise the leg. So management of back pain from a back strain is limited bed rest. You don't want to put them on complete bed rest, just like with an ankle sprain or any other muscle strain. The longer you immobilize them, the longer it takes them to heal. Medications, you can use muscle relaxants like cyclobenzaprine, 5 to 10 milligrams by mouth, three times a day as needed for pain. This can be fairly sedating for some people, so make sure it's not. Make sure the first time they take it, uh, they're in a situation where they don't have to be awake and alert. A lot of people find that they function reasonably well while taking these and so may be able to use those during their waking times. Again, they don't heal anything, but they decrease the muscle spasm and make them more comfortable. They may need opiates to help them sleep, so hydrocodone, acetaminophen, 5 milligrams of hydrocodone and 375 milligrams of acetaminophen, that's how they come as a single tab. Uh, one to two every four to six hours is needed for pain. And then possibly a benzodiazepine like Valium uh, or diazepam, 5 to 10 milligrams by mouth in the evening or at bedtime to help them sleep. Also, heat over the area, people often say helps. Cold may help. People seem to like heat more. Gentle stretching exercises once the back starts to feel better. And you can talk to medical control about those. There's a million of them online. And if they've got sciatica symptoms, we add oral steroids, prednisone 40 milligrams a day for seven days, and that helps with the inflammation of the sciatic nerve. Please complete any associated knowledge assessments, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact your professor or instructor. Thank you very much.